Welcome to this, the final episode in the series, Theology of Law, a very short introduction. During the last nine episodes, we've looked at eight biblical floodlights in order to understand the place of law within God's purposes for humankind. We looked at creation in our first episode, and we saw that God gave laws in creation from the beginning. Christian theology calls these laws the natural law. We saw that Jesus is the center of creation. Everything has been created by him and for him, Colossians 1 declares. And we saw that God has given good gifts in creation, including life and dignity and liberty, the capacity to form meaningful relationships, the ability to enjoy rewarding work and rest. In our second episode, we explored how the fall has marred but not wholly destroyed the goodness of creation. Because of the fall, we find ourselves in a situation in which we need government to impose and enforce rules, but governments are themselves marked by sin. Because the fall has affected our ability to comprehend the natural law, we are liable to misunderstand it, and therefore we need the example of Israel and the illumination of Jesus Christ in order to help us. But because of the fall, any attempt to bring about the perfect society will result in tyranny and the loss of human, di human dignity, liberty and life, rather than freedom and justice. In our third episode, we looked at God's actions in common grace and providence, showing goodness to all that God has made, preserving creation against the full consequences of the fall, and preparing people to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. We understood common grace, symbolised by the rainbow, is God's promise that God has not abandoned the world, but is at work within it, preserving it and preparing it. As Louis Burkott put it, common grace disturbs the destructive power of sin, maintains in a measure the moral order of the universe, thus making an orderly life possible, distributes in varying degrees gifts and talents among human beings, promotes the development of science and art, and showers untold blessings on us. And we saw that providence is about God's continuing involvement in the universe, working for good, despite the rebellion of human beings. In our fourth episode, we considered how, as Christians, we should understand the Torah, the law of Moses. We saw that for Christians, following Jesus is what matters. The priority of Jesus over the Torah and the prophets was shown to his disciples in the Transfiguration. And we saw that Jesus himself points us towards the Torah as part of the revelation of God through which we may discover what it means to love one another. And we understood that the rules given in the Torah are entwined with the story of God's faithfulness to Israel and Israel's decidedly mixed reactions to God. We saw that at the heart of the Torah are the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. And as Jesus made clear in Matthew chapter 22 verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The two great commandments do not make all other moral principles redundant. Instead, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13, they sum up the rest of the Torah. We explored how the idea of justice is that of right relationships and how our obligations to treat one another rightly are exemplified throughout the Old Testament by the ways in which we treat the relationally disadvantaged, the widow, the orphan and the foreigner. We examined the biblical vision of Shalom, the good society in which people act justly towards one another and take a special care of the vulnerable. Shalom is present when people are living in right relationships with each other. Shalom does not come apart from obedience to God's laws, but through obedience to God's laws. And I suggested some helpful resources for understanding how Christians might look to the Torah for inspiration today. The fifth episode was the first of two episodes looking at Israel's history. We looked at how the Old Testament thinks of God as Israel's king, and how despite constant questioning thrown up by Israel's experience, uh, the Old Testament affirms that Yahweh, God, is just. We saw that the book of Judges teaches that laws alone, without in effective enforcement mechanisms, are not sufficient to make people act justly. We looked at the history of Israel's kings, and we saw how they mostly failed to act justly. But even when they did, the results did not last. We looked at Josiah, one of the few just kings, and saw how his commitment to God was matched by his concern for justice and for the poor and the needy. In our sixth episode, we concentrated on the message of the prophets. We saw how justice, as well as being the centre of the message of Amos, was also a theme in the other prophets, both before, during and after the exile. And we saw how justice requires both just institutional actions, mishpatim, but also just actions by people both within and outside institutional frameworks, actions that are sedek. 
we saw how the prophets challenged the nations for their violations of natural law and challenged Israel for its violations of the Torah, the law of Moses. We saw how the prophets were consistent in their insistence that you cannot be right with God without acting justly towards your neighbours. And we saw how Zechariah, looking back after the exile, declared that Israel had been sent into exile because it had failed to administer justice, mercy and compassion, and had oppressed the widow, the orphan, the foreigner and the poor. In our seventh episode, we looked at the impact of the work of Jesus Christ and the redemption he has won for us. We reflected on the glorious truths about how Jesus is the center of creation. The second Adam, the one who has succeeded where Adam has failed. How Jesus is greater than Moses who gave the law. How Jesus is greater than Aaron and all of the priests. How Jesus is greater than David and Solomon and all of the kings. How Jesus is greater than Elijah and all of the prophets. How Jesus is justice personified. How Jesus is the one who's poured out the Holy Spirit and how Jesus is the one to whom the Father has entrusted the final judgment. And we saw that Jesus has demonstrated God's justice by delivering people from evil. How Jesus gives a her, us a hermeneutic and a way of interpreting the law. How the transfiguration shows the superiority of Jesus to the law and the prophets and how Jesus gives us an example of self-sacrifice. And we thought about how Jesus's crucifixion was an injustice and his execution in breach of both Jewish and Roman laws. We saw how God the Father has vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. How the resurrection is the Father's deliverance of Jesus, the one who has by his death delivered us. And we saw how the resurrection shows us that God will overturn injustice, that God will overcome sinfulness, and that God will rescue us from evil. Because of who Jesus is, everything belongs to Jesus both spiritual things and material things, both eternal things and temporary things. By contrast, government only has temporary control over material things. The work and person of Jesus shows us that government is limited, that government is fallible, that all decisions taken by human rulers will be reviewed in the final court of appeal in which Jesus sits as judge. In our eighth episode, we looked at the mission of the church to proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ. We saw that the church has been given the Great Commission and that uh, in fulfilling the two great commandments, uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself, the church is carrying out the Great Commission. We saw that as Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Therefore, he is the Lord of life and faith in him cannot be kept private. And we explored how the key messages of the church to government are that government is accountable, that government is limited, that government's primary calling is to do justice, and that government is there to serve all, especially the weakest, the disadvantaged, and those without the relational networks to cope. And we also thought about the means by which the church carries out its mission, and recognised that these are to be modelled on Jesus' own ministry, and that the church is to act in truth with grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in our last episode, we looked at the significance of our future hope for an understanding of the role of law in this world. We saw that the final judgment is a necessity. We saw that the final judgment will be given by Jesus Christ, that the final judgment will reveal the whole truth, that the final judgment will condemn evil, that the final judgment will overturn just unjust verdicts, that the final judgment will deliver victims, that the final judgment will provide a new start, that the final judgment will be given by the advocate for the defence that the final judgment will reward faith, and that the final judgment will be followed by the full enjoyment of the presence of God. Given that the final judgment is coming, and that God is patient wanting everyone to come to repentance, it is the need for judgment in the here and now that must be justified. The Holy Spirit is the one who is given in order that the righteous requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in Christians, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 verse 4. So we don't need judgments in order to make us perfect because we know that they cannot do so. But nonetheless, judgments are still required on earth to condemn evil, to preserve society and to promote peace. The final judgment should affect the contents of these judgments because rulers, including judges, should remember that they too will be judged, should maintain justice and do what is right should recognise that we are all in the same boat, that the world does not divide into us and them, and that we should show mercy whenever that is possible. 
Thank you very much for joining me on this very short introduction to the theology of law. I'd like to remind you that if you want to go deeper into these ideas, you can pick up a copy of my book, A Biblical View of Law and Justice. Look at other talks and articles by me, as well as other resources from Christian thinkers I found especially helpful at the website www.theologyoflaw.org. Make use of the information and opportunities provided by the Lawyers Christian Fellowship, including on its Essential Truths course. And sign up for the Mission of uh, Justice and Theology of Law course at Spurgeon's College, much of which is taught online. God bless.